Good morning, everyone. So it is my distinct pleasure this morning to welcome you and to be your moderator for this session on quantum perspectives. We're gonna get started right away. I know that we're gonna have some engaging discussion and some very insightful presentations today. I'm gonna to go ahead and start right away with our first speaker, and that is Dr. Carol Scarlett. She is an experimental nuclear and particle physicist, and she's a faculty member at Florida A&M. Now, she has worked on a spectrum of topics, including nuclear decay rates, um, searches for exotic or dark matter, and then more recently on the development of quantum random number generation on chip-scaled devices. Her broad research interests have their foundation in her undergraduate studies in electrical engineering and in her advanced degrees in nuclear physics. She is a former fellow of the Chain Reaction Innovations Program at Argonne National Laboratory, where she focused on using her patented technique to design QRNG on-chip devices. Now, obviously, Dr. Scarlett has a distinguished uh, has distinguished expertise and experience as a researcher. What I have to say I find notable about her upon some Google searches were reviews from her university students with direct quotes such as, she is by far the best physics professor, she really, you can tell she really cares about her students and the subject she teaches. She's a very nice lady. I would like, I would not have made it this far without her. She's willing to go over and beyond for her students. Academic and research prowess is indeed needed for discovery and innovation now, today, but such commitment to building our future researchers and to ensuring their success is indeed quite commendable. So with that, Dr. Scarlett, we're happy to have you here today, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for that warm introduction. Um, so, uh, as Laura mentioned, uh, I started out in nuclear and particle physics. I'm actually still in nuclear and particle physics. I still do exotic particle searches. Um, and there's an interesting story that connects that sort of math and physics to quantum information and quantum sciences. And it's sort of how I got interested in what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, which is quantum computing hardware. Now this is gonna be a sort of upper level talk where I hope to emphasize uh, an array of different technologies that are being explored um, and what's coming down the pipe as far as quantum hardware and then segue that into the types of algorithms and computers. But that said, I'm going to start with discussing sort of the how I got here to talk to you today about quantum hardware and quantum computing. So as Laura mentioned, um, I do exotic particle searches. I look to have photons, which are quantum objects. I look to have them interact with exotic matter, dark matter, the stuff that we believe makes up 80% of our galaxy. So one day I'm talking to a colleague of mine who's also a dear friend, and she's in computer information sciences, and I'm explaining to her how myself and this theorist that I had been working with, Mikhail Kankaseev, uh, how we had been working to develop the math that would describe how polarized photons, so this is in a quantum state, propagating through this dark matter background and being reflected and in a cavity, you know, what should happen to them as a result? And I said to her that, well, interestingly enough, um, our, our computation seems to suggest that we ought to be seeing noise. And I'm thinking as a physicist, I wanna measure you know, exact signals and discrete things, so I'm thinking noise, oh, gosh, that's really awful. And she's so excited, she's like, noise, oh, there's all kind of things you can do with that. Because I'm also explaining to her that this is basically quantum random walking, that that's the, the cause of the noise, it's just a quantum effect. Um, and she's saying, by the end of the talk, uh, she had me believing that we could do quantum random number generation, which is something I've pursued since then, and that quite possibly we might be able to develop better cybersecurity devices. And as I began to dig into it, I began to realize what other people about 40 years ago had already seen the promise in quantum. And that is that uh, if you develop the right system, you can take advantage of it, not just for creating noise, which is useful in encryption, but you can also take advantage of it in terms of creating novel computing applications. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. So, 
Uh, everybody, I'm sure, of course, is in computer science, you're familiar with ones and zeros and the transistors that you use in order to create those ones and zeros. Um, about 40 years ago, physicists began to realize that in addition to ones and zeros, quantum objects would allow you to go further because they would allow you to not only have your ones and zeros, but then to introduce superimposed states where you could get quantum interference effects. And I'll tell you what that means in a second. And so the idea of a qubit, of a quantum mechanical object that you could manipulate to store information, then would allow you to have one, zero, or some superimposed or even entangled state. And so now we could contemplate building systems we, uh, where we would use quantum objects to replace transistors. And that has a number of other advantages, although I will tell you, you will see several disadvantages along the way. Uh, but in the future, it could have a number of advantages. For one, you could store more information. You can pack more information into a single qubit. For two, transistors are limited in terms of physical space. Eventually, you get something so small that it's defective, it doesn't work right, where quantum objects are really, really tiny. And I mentioned that I started out looking at photons. Well, now you can have objects where you can, that are bosons, they can basically sit right on top of each other. So you could contemplate a time when you would be able to use quantum information to encode higher amounts of data, but also you'd be able to manipulate that data very fast. And so that is the promise of quantum computers, is to use these uh, quantum states. But what are these quantum states? And why do they allow us to better store and manipulate information? So if you see here, I have two matrices. And I talk about the difference between a superimposed versus a mixed state. So you're all familiar with ones and zeros. Imagine I have some uh, uh, two beams of photons and one of them is prepared with vertical uh, polarization, the other one's prepared with horizontal polarization. We'll label the vertical polarization one, the horizontal polarization zero. Then you'd imagine I have a mixed state because I can have these photons basically propagating through space. And in that mixed state, I could store ones and zeros. Now if I perform an operation, if I say put this through a polarizer, look at the intensity, and that's really what quantum bits are all about, is being able to pick the right operations to extract information, then my mixed state is only gonna give me one and zero, and I can move on. However, if I prepare a quantum state of photons that have a polarization that is 45 degrees to the vertical, on the surface you say, okay, but that's still the same as having some photons will collapse into vertical, some will collapse into horizontal. So your first thought is, well, you're back to ones and zeros. However, if you look at this matrix, you'll notice off diagonal terms. Those are interference terms. Those are coherence terms. Those terms allow me to store additional information because now the thing that will give me the ones and zeros also exists as a superimposed state. So imagine my beam of photons, they're prepared in one basis vector, they're prepared with polarizers. And then I come in with a system that will look for rotated photons. In other words, I apply a new type of math or algorithm onto my system. And this is how quantum mechanics works. I am going to detect a difference between these two matrices based purely on the fact that the first one has an interference off diagonal term. And not to dive too deep into quantum mechanics, but I did tell you I was a nuclear physicist, so that's fair warning. Um, but the basis of it is now I can encode information in that superimposed state. Now I can perform an operation where I can extract that, op extract that information. And then I can perform another operation where I can put the system back into the same state and I can vary the amount of superposition. And so on and on, you can pack more information into simple quantum objects. And that can be as small as an electron. That can be as small as a molecule. That can be as small as a single atom. And so now, where I had to have a transistor that had many, many atoms in order to make it work, I can pack more information into something that is smaller. And on the surface, this all sounds like good news, but just wait till you see the sizes of these devices and then you'll understand the difficulty in making quantum hardware work. Okay. Um, the other thing that I can do with quantum mechanics that is very, very unique is something called entanglement. 
If I take my photons and I put them through a birefringent material, I can entangle those photons. What that means, a measurement on one of a two photon system automatically tells me what the other photon is doing. So this is another way that I can communicate, I can use uh, what's quantum encryption, um, entangled photons, in order to send a message to one person where if someone else were to try to make a measurement on the system, they would collapse the system and then the message would be lost. So the two things that we can do, superposition and encryption, I mean, excuse me, superposition and entanglement, as a way of stacking more information into a qubit and as a way of doing something that we cannot fundamentally do with our regular ones and zeros. Okay, now that's interesting enough that we have this way of packing more information into something that is smaller, but that doesn't get you a computer. So a guy by the name of uh, Divicini, um, and forgive me if I'm butchering his name, I believe is Italian, he came up with sort of a rubric for here's what has to be so in order for you to go from having quantum information and quantum bits to having a quantum computer. Because at the end of the day, we want to be able to repeat this process to make it reliable and to actually build something out of it. And as you see here, what he came up with is, first, you want a system that's going to be scalable. It wouldn't make much sense if your qubits were only, you were only ever going to be able to have two qubits at a time. This would be great, but it, it wouldn't allow you to do any data manipulation. Then second, you had to have a reliable way of putting the system in a particular state. As I mentioned a moment ago, if I started out with a bunch of photons, I have to have a reliable way of making them superimpose, as opposed to mixing the photons. I can take two photon beams, one polarized vertical, one polarized horizontal. That doesn't necessarily give me a superposition. I need to do something to them, like put them through uh, birefringent material, put them through specific polarizers in order to make them superimpose. And so I need a way of continuously doing this. And for that, the second thing that I have to be able to do is I have to reliably be able to recreate a ground state and to be able to flip that ground state and recreate the process. Now, the thing about quantum objects, they interact with their environment and that coherence term that I showed you earlier, they lose coherence. So as they propagate through space, photons, electrons, they will interact with any and everything. And so you need something that's going to be coherent long enough for you to perform a calculation. Luckily, we have gigabit and gigahertz instrumentation that allows us to very rapidly change a state. And so therefore, we can rapidly perform calculations as long as we can get the qubits to last for maybe some tens of seconds, microseconds, um, and such. Uh, and then finally, in order to have a quantum system, a quantum computer, you want to be able to rebuild what we do classically, which is we create gates. So we take information and we say that if two pieces of information agree, then we may have an AND gate that gives us a one. If they disagree, we may have that the gate gives us back a signal of zero. So in order to manipulate the information, at some point we're going to have to be able to make gates. Now the thing about quantum objects, because they're so prone to interacting with their environment and going decoherent, um, the question then becomes, well, how can you get them to interact without messing up the state. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second because that's actually important for quantum error and error correction. Okay, so we have now an idea of what we would want to do with these qubit systems in order to make them work. But what is the qubit? What is the thing that's holding the quantum information? Where is that going? Is that a photon? Is that an ion or an electron? Uh, currently, all of these technologies you see here, molecular, NMR, superconducting chip, trapped ion, photon, quantum dots, and there's actually more that I just don't have time to list, but all of these technologies are currently being used in various quantum computing systems in order to store and manipulate information. They are serving as the qubits for the quantum computing system. Um, okay, and so now I have a qubit and I have a process to manipulate it, to put it in some state, to change the state that it's in. So now the next step is 
well, a computer would be useless if we couldn't interact with it. It would be useless if we couldn't give it information and ask it to perform some task, some simulation, ask it to send a message. So currently, modern quantum computers are hybrid systems. These are systems that take, at the host processor level, they take in information from peripherals so that a user like you or me can sit and key in a code and tell it what we want it to do. And then they provide that information to something called the control processor, which says, if I'm going to perform an AND gate or OR gate or any other process on this quantum system, here's what I need to do. I mentioned the photons earlier, and I said that if I prepare them in a superimposed state, I have photons that have different linear polarizations prepared in a superimposed state, and then I subject them to a rotator. Well, I can extract the superimposed information from them by subjecting them to this rotator. So something has to tell my system that you want to put a rotator in now so that when those photons come through, we can determine how they were superimposed and we can perform this calculation. And this sort of starts at this level of, uh, pro of control processor where you translate whatever task you want to do into some sort of set of, of, um, set of physical processes that have to take place on that quantum object. Next, you have the layer that is quantum control. This is the layer where you will actually make a determination. Am I gonna send in an RF field, for example, if I'm trying to flip a state in some ion trap? Uh, or am I gonna send in a field, a microwave field, if I want to manipulate an object, a molecule that is inside of some NMR? So this is a stage where right above the qubits, you actually have the instrumentation that's going to take the orders and then it's going to go through and implement those measurements in order to, to take out the superposition information or to encode the superposition information. And so now we have a quantum computer. Yay. So, but quantum computers, as I mentioned earlier, quantum objects want to interact with everything. And so even though we can make a quantum computer, we do have a number of issues that we have to take into account, such as noise, decoherence, all of these things will degrade the quantum state. Um, you, in the literature, will read about something called operational fidelity, which will tell you how sensitive these qubits are to their environment, how likely are they to stay around. And some of the qubits I'm about to tell you about, you know, the, the longest lasting is about one second. So they don't stay around for very long. Another obstacle to realizing these quantum systems uh, as quantum computers is that you have connectivity issues. So I mentioned that we want to make gates. So I want to find out if qubit one is in a certain state and qubit two is in a certain state, the same way I make gates for classical computers. It's transistor one on and transistor two on or off, so that's my AND gate, OR gate, NOR gate, and such. Well, we want to capture that same structure in quantum mechanics, except, of course, when these objects interact or interact with their environment, you run up against issues of whether you will accidentally flip one of them and get information uh, that is not what you there's not useful information. So one of the first types of quantum computers, here is a quantum NMR. And the basis of this type of circuit is I put, uh, I, I put a molecule like malonic acid inside of an NMR, and this is held in a big magnetic field. And I use an RF cavity in order to manipulate the states. And this allows me to encode information. It allows me to perform algorithms on it. There are a number of companies now that are boasting that they can develop NMR for the desktop. Now, of course, this company only develops two bits at a time, just to show you how simplistic it is, but it's a nice learning tool and it helps students understand how to work with a quantum computer, and it also helps people who want to do programming understand how to program a quantum computer. One of the biggest techniques for doing quantum computing is the superconductor. And this involves using something called Joseph Jun junctions. These are electrical devices where you have superconducting currents. And you allow those superconducting currents to interact. And then as they interact, you can 
uh, create gates out of them. You can manipulate information. You can store information. What I have here are a couple of examples, D-Wave and the other one on the, uh, to the right side is, um, uh, is an IBM machine. And you'll see a nice dilution refrigerator because to create superconducting, you have to refrigerate down to about four or five Kelvin which means to make these devices work to extract their quantum property and to use their quantum properties for manipulating information, you've got to supercool the system. And that means you need a big dilution refrigerator. And that is why these devices are not on your desktop. And right now, they won't be on your desktop anytime soon until we either find superconductors that can go to room temperature or we find some other material or mechanism. However, in the laboratories, these devices have shown a lot of promise for producing as many as 400 or more qubits. And as I mentioned earlier, the qubit holds more information and allows you to manipulate it very fast. So these are achieving success in quantum computing by being able to allow users remotely to access and program these devices and perform calculations. So you can test out your traveling salesman or any other type of simulation you'd like to perform. Another um, thing that is happening as a result of uh, as a result of the development of superconductor uh, computers is that we're starting to see a lot of companies uh, that are coming forth and developing control technology. So with the growth of quantum computing, we have a growth in industries that weren't there before that are now coming up with electrical devices in order to make those signals that you can send to act on your qubits and such. OK? Another type of qubit currently being explored and in use is trapped ions. You see here an example of NIST, which trap beryllium ions in order to switch their states, in order to switch their quantum mechanical spin states so that you can encode information. Um, since then, there have been companies that have come through and used calcium and strontium in order to exchange electrical information between these quantum objects. The drawback of these types of systems is, again, you need to refrigerate them down to about 5 Kelvin. So these devices aren't on your desktop, and in fact, they require a lot of uh, cooling. Another drawback is that decoherence time is about one second. So if all your calculations aren't performed, then your quantum state has degraded, and you have to start over. You have to rebuild it. But they show a lot of um, ability to interconnect, and that means it's easier to make gates out of these devices. Um, once again, there's a lot, a whole hardware industry which is coming into existence and growing as a result of this type of technology trapped ions being provided. Um, now, my personal favorite, because I only got into this field more or less to manipulate photons, so my personal favorite is the manipulation of photons. Now, photons can also be used as qubits. However, light moves at three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Light just doesn't stand still. So unlike trapped ions, unlike the molecules in the NMR and the superconductor, you have to make a light qubit a little bit differently. That is, you are using squeeze states, but you're also using multiple photons. That's the only way right now in order to get uh, photonic qubits to work. And you see here, I mentioned earlier, that uh, one process for superposition is using materials like beam splitters. These are nonlinear materials that will cause to a photon passing through to, uh, to undergo a superposition of eigenstates passing through a beam splitter. And there's a whole history of working with photons and working with photonic technology. There's almost no end to the number of companies developing lasers, developing uh, optically uh, coherent devices, developing your beam splitters. And so there's like 50 years of technology that already exists. You really don't have to reinvent the wheel if you're using photonics. Uh, and photonics, again, it has its, uh, its, its major drawbacks. It has a short coherence time of about one second. But its major advantages is all of these companies that have been around for a long time and have uh, real expertise 
uh, all of them are playing a role in the advancement of this type of qubit because they're making the hardware and infrastructure that makes it possible. I can go buy off the shelf equipment and I can propagate photons and make these quantum tests that at least I know that, I know in general and in theory how this works or how photonics works. Uh, and it goes on. There's also the use of quantum dots. This is another advancement in quantum computing. It's another alternative to all of the other technologies I've just talked about. Uh, in the quantum dot, you use uh, quantum dot systems in order to hold electrons. And one uh, way that you can manipulate this is you can have side-by-side -side quantum dots where an electron is free to move in some sort of state between the two. You can superimpose that so that a measurement of the electron on the left gives you a one, on the right it gives you a zero, and because you can superimpose it, again, you can encode more information. Um, the drawback to that was impurities and decoherence. When I'm talking about at a high level, making a qubit out of quantum dots or out of any of these systems, keep in mind that reality hits and experimental equipment is always flawed. That is why the systems with supercooled uh, trapped ions tend to work very well because they're kind of isolated from everything else. So quantum dots is another alternative for manufacturing qubits. Um, and you can use either the presence of the electron where it physically is located or you can use its spin. There's a lot of research active right now in using spin as an alternative to localizing the electron. And of course, all of these systems have the ability for you to make gates out of them for you to allow multiple quantum dots to interact so that you can do uh, manipulations in order, to, in order to process information. So now that I've talked about the qubits and what types of systems are appropriate, what quantum information we can encode and, and what sort of quantum properties we're after, let's move one step up, step back to the um, control and measurement plane. So in the control and measurement plane, this is where you send a signal to a qubit in order to measure what its state is. And this is where you send signals to qubits in order to flip the states. If you want to form gates, you have to be able to flip a state from one to zero, and this is done at this measurement plane. Um, of course, that means you now have your quantum information, again, interacting with the environment, interacting with other qubits, and the real problem becomes, uh, becomes that you can diminish your overall performance. So this plane, by the way, determines pretty much the speed of your quantum system and the speed of your quantum computer. But this plane is also the one that introduces most of your error. So you introduce measurement error here, you introduce isolation flaws, you introduce pretty much all of, uh, all of these errors get introduced at this stage. And as a result, your system becomes decoherent, you lose access to your state and you have to start the process all over again of rebuilding it. Now, if we step back one more layer, you have a plane where the actual algorithm that says, okay, I need to apply a beam splitter at this moment in time, and then after the beam splitter, I need to apply some polarization mechanism in order to determine what my quantum state is. So if you go pull back now to the quantum process control, you have the state where whatever it is you want to manipulate, whatever information you want to make a multiplication, you want to register information. Now you pull back to a level where the actual algorithm has to be developed. Um, and again, quantum computers hold the promise of faster communications, faster manipulation of data. Um, and as a result, there's a whole slew of companies that are either developing their own quantum computer, that are developing the software for quantum computers, that are using the existing quantum computers and infrastructure. And this is driving the industry and it's driving a whole economic network. So I did want to take a moment to say something about the fact that 
you know, even in the financial sector, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, there's a lot of interest in making quantum computers work. And as a uh, computing audience, you may be familiar with the promise of one day breaking RSA encryption with quantum computers or the promise of just being able to process data or simulations, simulating weather patterns significantly faster with a quantum computer. So this is a testimony to all of the interest in developing these devices. And finally, as a former chain reaction innovator, I have to just give a shout out to uh, two of my colleagues who worked to provide quantum computing software. This would allow an individual at their desk at home to write a code and have it run on IBM's quantum superconducting quantum computer, or to write a code and have it run on D-Wave or any of the other quantum computers. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with someone who worked for Qbraid uh, and someone who also worked for Supertech. And these, this is where we get to uh, the human interface between these computers. This is where the computers now look out at the rest of the world is through being able to have folks come in and write their codes. And on that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Scarlett. That was very nice. All right, so we'll now take questions. Now, there are two microphones, one here, one here in the room. Also, for those of you that are online, if you go to your digital experience and pose some questions, we will be able to take them from there. I see some folks walking up, okay. Please. Hi, uh, you mentioned originally being inspired by a physics experiment to yes. think about quantum computation. Um, do you also think about how quantum computation could help us better understand physics? Oh, absolutely. Um, quantum computation would allow us to model systems. There are physical systems that we have to measure because we can't perform any modeling on them. For example, I'm a nuclear physicist. And when we get nuclei that are these larger masses like your uraniums and thoriums and such, we reach a scale where you know, it would take many, many years to model how those nuclei work. So we sort of do this hand waving and say, ah, we'll just crash them together and see what comes out. So this would uh, tremendously speed up our ability to determine uh, if some of our shell model were actually showing things like time reversal violations or overlapping of parity states. So there is a lot uh, we can do in physics um, with quantum computers that right now with classical computers, it would just take us too long. This is Pradeep from KLA. Very interesting overview of the various technologies. Thank you, it was really educative. Uh, I'm going to follow up on the previous question and ask, to solve real world problems, right, realistic problems, how many qubits do you think you need in a system? And in your opinion, how far are we from that time? Okay, that's an excellent question and thank you for that question. So there are studies that say, if I had 100 reliable qubits, how much faster I could go than uh, a classical computer? Um, what I was hoping that I emphasize is that current technology with quantum computers is such that there's a lot of decoherence, there's a lot of error, there's a lot of noise. And so we have computers that have 400 qubits and you go, okay, well, why aren't we showing quantum supremacy? Why aren't we beating out classical computers and calculations? And it comes down to these systems are very noisy. So those qubits are only lasting for a certain amount of time, which means you're limited to how many calculations you can perform while you have a reliable state. Um, and so in theory, if we had 100 perfect qubits, 
we would see a difference between a classical system and the quantum system. It would beat out the classical system. Right now, we have systems with over 400 qubits, and we're not seeing that supremacy, although there's a group out of China, I think they're with uh, Xanadu, that are now claiming they've done it with photonics. I don't know enough about the details to verify that, but there is a claim now that there's, they're able to do calculations much faster using photonic qubits. Um, but that said, if we got rid of the noise, it could be as little as 100. With the current state of the art, it may actually take thousands of qubits. But this is still, you're comparing it to millions and billions of transistors in a normal computer. So this is still, to be able to compete with a normal computer or even keep up with a normal computer, this is still a lot. Thanks. Excellent. Please. So you mentioned a bunch of different uh, quantum technologies like quantum dot, photons, trapped ion. Do you see there being a coalesce, coalescing around like one or two technologies or do you think that this mm -hmm. is just going to be uh, different applications will make use of these different uh, qubits? Well, that, that actually is a really excellent question. Right now, on the software side, people are developing software so that it may not matter what your qubit is. The qubit just may be able to calculate faster. So you just have a faster calculator, but you don't know where that's coming from. So it may be that, they, that the different technologies won't be applied to different types of calculations. It may be that all technologies can be used at some level. Um, I think what people are coalescing around is more or less which of these systems are more reliable. So the superconducting system is fairly reliable. You've got big competitors like IBM that has been every couple of years coming out with a new superconducting system and they're getting better and better, more qubits, less noise, more reliable. Um, as I mentioned, you have folks out of China that have boasted they've been able to do this with photonic qubits. I think that eventually one of these technologies will probably emerge as just structurally more sound, less noisy, and you'll be able to build computers faster. The thing that I like about photons is that you can go to room temperatures, whereas with a lot of these other devices, you've got to go very low in temperature to make them work. I don't yet know which one is going to win. And there's a lot of money and a lot of development and a lot of resources going into each one. So I would not make that call just yet, although I am biased to photons. But I won't make that call just yet. Thank you. Thank you, and that kind of goes to one of the questions that was online that said in 10 to 20 years, do you think there will be so many quantum technologies being developed or will only some of them prevail? So do you see one real winner or do you see that we're going to have a suite based on the different technologies and computation types? Right now we have a suite. I believe that over time, just someone with an engineering background, over time something emerges as a better tool. So I believe over time, one of them is going to emerge as a better tool. One of them is going to be cheaper to make, faster to make, and everyone's going to sort of go in that direction. But that hasn't happened yet. And so it's really a guessing game if you're trying to say, is it going to be the superconductors? Is it going to be the trapped ion? I, I um, feel more comfortable saying we have a suite, but one of those is going to emerge. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I'm going to take another question from the digital uh, in this direction. Can you elaborate a little bit on the idea about the quantum random number generator? Oh, sure. So with a quantum random number generator, you're using a quantum property in order to manipulate the state of a photon. Like, for example, if I have a propagating photon and I have to have it go through a beam splitter, if that propagating photon is in a superposition of states relative to the beam splitter, because this is the thing about quantum mechanics, when you prepare your system, it's always in some state relative to some uh, measurable. Mm -hmm. So if you have a superposition of states relative to the beam splitter, then your photon has to collapse into one. It has to decide, am I vertical or am I horizontal? There's only going to be one. Even if it's superimposed, it's going to end up being one. So then you can use that to manipulate how that photon moves in space so that you can kind of push it in different directions, do a little random walking. I uh, see we have someone at the microphone. Hi. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Peng Ying from NCSA. I am very interested in the financial and timing cost for now that if a researcher want to, you know, try to use a quantum computer or, you know, 
plan to you know post post port some codes to the quantum computer how long normally they need to wait if they want to you know just use like academia quantum computer or you know in the market if they go to market how much financial cost they supposed to prepare for this kind of transfer based on your what you know for now Okay, so based on what I know, there are currently platforms, software platforms, which my, uh, my fellow speaker is going to talk more about, but there are currently software platforms that would allow you to request time on any one of these large devices, like on the IBM device or Honeywell or any of the other computers. Um, I do not know what the exact cost is, but I know that some of these platforms are really trying to push quantum forward, so they're working with education, educational institutions to try to get free time for people who are just interested and want to write a code and say, I ran on a quantum computer. Um, I could get back to you with cost, because I don't, off the top of my head, know that, but I do know that there's software platforms that are working in conjunction with IBM and with educational institutions to try to make this something that any person can do. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think, oh, so we have one, I think we have time for one more question, and we'll take it to you. Uh, hi. Hi. I'm, I'm Tyler Burkett, uh, University of Kentucky. I, I believe as a part of your, um, talk, you mentioned that like at the moment, uh, quantum computers are a hybrid system. Do you yes. think it's practical at any point in the future that they'll be purely qubit based or do you still think it'll be hybrid for pretty much the duration? Okay, so let me explain what I mean by hybrid and I think that it'll be hybrid for the entire duration. So what I mean when I say a hybrid system, if I'm a person who wants to run a simulation, let's say I simulate weather patterns, and I wanna run my simulation on a quantum computer. As a programmer, I have to sit down and write a program. Now, if I'm not a physicist or researcher, and I'm not the expert in when do I put in one layer versus another layer to flip the state or to, to gate it, then what I depend on is handing that code off to some instrumentation that's going to translate what I'm asking for, multiplication, division, and such, translate that into a quantum algorithm. Okay, so at some point, in order for me to write my code, I'm gonna use a keyboard, I'm gonna use a mouse, I'm probably gonna have a screen that I type my code out so I can see what it is. Those components are all classical, and that's not gonna change. As long as you have a human component, you're gonna need those classical components. Um, where it becomes quantum is once I hand the algorithm off, something has to translate it to say, if I'm using a trapped ion qubit, I need to send uh, a certain microwave pulse through the qubit in order to flip the state, in order to perform this calculation, perform this register, uh, do my registers and such. So there's a piece of code that translates between what I'm asking for, which is all classical stuff, and between actually operating on the qubit, which requires a transition. So I think we'll always have that hybrid system. But right now, the quantum computers, they're not going back to use transistors for the most part, not, not at the lower qubit level. It's just at the higher levels, you still have to use some of the same technology that's classical. So I hope that answers. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. Thank you. And there were several other very, uh, very uh, wonderful questions on the digital platform, and I'm sorry we won't be able to get to them at this time. But Dr. Scarlett, thank you very, very much. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Give a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, Dr. Scarlett. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.